but we're going to cover plenty of scripture tonight and uh, dedicate this time to the Lord. So why don't we pray and ask his presence and blessing. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you, Father, for our freedom and our ability, Lord, to gather and worship in this way tonight. Father, we look forward to uh, the Sunday and, Lord willing, a couple weeks where we get to meet together in person as we are planning and projecting. And, Lord, we just pray that you would work out all those details. We pray, Father, your people would be able to come back together, Lord, to worship you in this place. And, Father, we thank you for tonight and this time of worship before us. I pray, Father, that you would speak to each and every person who is here. Father, we pray for those who are feeling isolated tonight. Those whom this season of social distance and isolation has been rather difficult. Lord, I pray for encouragement. I pray for hope. I pray for connection with you in our relationship with you. And we pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified by everything we say and do tonight. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So our passage tonight is 2 Samuel 15, 18 through 37. And the title we've given the message is Faith and Friendship. Two things that we see taking place in the life of King David in 2 Samuel at this point. Now, I heard a quote on Christian radio this week that I'd like to share with you. I don't know who the pastor was, but I remember his words. And this is what he said. He said, most of the things in life you and I need to learn can only be learned through relationship. I thought that was pretty profound. That many of the lessons we learn and the things we need to grow in come through the context of relationship. Now, to isolate yourself from others, to stop being in relationship with them, puts you and I in an environment of stagnation where we cease to grow and we stop learning. You see, when we stop relating with others, when we stop learning, we start dying. And that's the reality. You and I should be lifelong learners, especially in our faith. The Word of God says that the disciples grew in grace and knowledge. We should be growing in those two facets of our faith, grace and knowledge. And we do a lot of that through relationship. That's why God did not save you and I to be Christians on an island by ourselves, to be part of a body, an organism, which the church is, that is living and growing, being shaped and shaping others. And so to stop being the church, to stop meeting as a church, is absolutely contradictory to our very nature in Christ. And so relationship is what God has created us for. I want you to think about why isolation, social isolation can be so dangerous for people like you and me. I read this quote from an obscure magazine called Slate.com, uh, but the title and this quote caught my attention. Loneliness is a serious health risk, and loneliness is about twice as dangerous as obesity. Social isolation impairs immune function and boosts inflammation, which can lead to arthritis, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. Loneliness is literally breaking our hearts, but as a culture, we rarely talk about it. We think that only people who are by themselves are lonely, but you can be surrounded by people and be the loneliest person in the room. You see, loneliness is a condition that God did not design for you and me. God created us for a relationship, and we all need it. Now, you might be an introvert. Any introverts out there? No, see, nobody who's an introvert would answer that question because they don't want to be noticed. Now, are there any extroverts out there? Right? Now, here's the reality. If you're an introvert and you like your alone time, don't think for a moment you don't need relationship. You just prefer a different kind of relationship. You see, introverts prefer quality over quantity. One or two solid, good connections with people, and an introvert is set right. An extrovert just wants interaction with a bunch of people. Quality isn't always as important. And then there's people who are blends of both. 
but we all need relationship because relationship causes us to grow. Relationship with God and others stirs us up, gives us passion, gives us purpose, and keeps us from being stagnant. Now, I don't know if you've ever been around bodies of water that were stagnant. My dad was a swimming pool contractor. And during the 80s and 90s, my dad's company helped to build some of the most extravagant and over-the-top pools in Southern California. Everywhere from Cota to Casa to our backyard in Anaheim Hills, the pools my dad was a part of were, were, were exceptional. Today, it's, they're not as big of a deal, but this is when r artificial rock and waterfalls weren't being done. My dad and the companies he worked with were doing it and doing it big. Now, my brothers and I were responsible to care for the family lake in the backyard, our swimming pool. It had a big pool. It had a spa on the hillside with the waterfall, waterfall down the hillside, kiddie pool, a lot of gallons of water. During the summer, we were on top of it. During the winter, however, we weren't jumping in it. We weren't using it. We weren't having pool parties. The pump wasn't running as much. The chemicals were being neglected. And so the water started to grow things. Algae of various kinds. Mosquitoes would lay their larvae in it. And you'd see little baby mosquitoes skimming across the top of the water. And we would have to clean this pool all weekend long when it got to that point. You see, because nobody was jumping in it and stirring up the water. Nothing, the pump wasn't being run to churn it up. No chemicals were being put in to maintain it. Nobody was enjoying it. <clears throat> you see, a swimming pool is a picture of your life and mine. Swimming pools are made to be shared and enjoyed with others. Same is true of your life and mine. Pools need people to jump in and out of them. Same is true of our lives. We need friendships coming in and out, helping us to grow, helping us to learn. Pools need people to stir them up. Just like you and I need people to stir us up in our life. And it's not always the easy people that stir you up, right? You know those difficult people? They're called kids. The ones who live in your home? <clears throat> they can stir me, yeah, honk to that one. They can stir me up pretty good and I'm sure they stir you up. We wouldn't have it any other way. But we need people to stir us up and keep us from being stagnant. And so relationships, from your relationship with God first and your relationship with other people in your life keep you from being stagnant. They help stir you up and give you passion. They help you to grow and they protect you from isolation and the internal death it causes. We are in a season of social distance which has led into isolation for many people. And I hope that even tonight, just seeing friendly faces in your church family, you're feeling a little less isolated, knowing that you're not alone, you're not going through it alone. And King David, of all times in his life, he needed to know that he wasn't isolated, that he wasn't alone, and the driving most important thing, even if every friend betrayed him at this point in his life, he needed to know that God Almighty was for him and not against him. And so I hope you leave tonight when I'm done with that driving theme, that God is for you. He is for you in every way. And that you're not alone even when you feel like it. So tonight, in order to look at King David's faith and the friendships that sustained him, we need to take account of where he is at in his life. What's gone on? If you were here last week, you've already got a lot of background. Those who weren't here, I'm going to sum it up in three very short points. David has a son. It's actually his third son named Absalom. Handsome. Handsomest guy in all of Israel, it says. Long flowing hair. Everybody loved Absalom. He happened to murder his older brother for sexually abusing his sister. He ends up getting away with it. He returns to Jerusalem. And over a four-year period, Absalom put in play a plan to become king. One problem, his dad was king. So what does that mean? He had to betray his dad. He had to get everybody to turn against his father and turn in favor towards him. 
So Absalom got a chariot with beautiful horses, 50 warriors to run in front of him. He looked like a king, talked like a king, and in four years' time, he got everybody in Israel to think he should be king. Because of that, he ended up, his conspiracy worked. All the cities in Jerusalem, all throughout Israel, declared him to be king, and King David and his servants had to flee before Absalom came back from Hebron. Because if Absalom came back, there would have been a military conflict and a lot of bloodshed. David was willing to let go of his position in order to save more people. He wasn't going to fight that fight because God hadn't called him to do that. God didn't call him to fight his son. Parents, just a side note. God has not called you to fight your son or your daughter. So don't get coaxed into a conflict or into a fight. Lead them, be an example to them, correct them depending on their age, but God has not called you to fight them. I just had to tell some of our kids in my office before we began, I said, guys, I want you to know mom and dad are for you. We are for you in every way. We're on your side and we're not against you. We need you to be for us and not against us, okay? They're like, okay. We're like, okay, Wozniak's on three. One, two, three. But before we did that, they kept arguing over whose hand was on top, right? I said, guys, stop. One, two, three, Wozniak, right? And we left because they need to know mom and dad are for them. But don't you and I need to know that God is for you? Because let's be honest, sometimes it looks like God isn't. If you judge God's favor towards you based on life circumstances, you've got the wrong criteria. God's for you because he sent Jesus to die for you. God's for you because he continues to provide for you. God's for you because he shared the gospel with you and gave you salvation in him. I don't think he could prove it any more clearly than through all the things God has done and is doing for you and I. But let's look at what's going on in David's life. Because now he's leaving Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 15, 16, and 17 will summarize that background. And then we'll get into the new passage. So the king went out and all his household after him. And the king left ten concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after them. And they halted at the last house. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you want to know what David was thinking at this very moment in his life? When he was being kicked out of the capital city, no longer king, he's at the last house on the block, what do you think King David was feeling in that very moment? Turn to Psalm 3. Psalm 3 will tell you and I what David was going through in this season of his life. We will see his faith in the Lord and how it sustained him. Psalm 3. Listen carefully to King David's words in this chapter and keep in mind what's he, what he's going through. Verse 1. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. David wrote that when he was fleeing from his son Absalom. That's what he was going through. One of the lowest points of his life, but he knew God was his shield and the lifter of his head. God would enable him to lay down and sleep in safety, for the Lord would sustain him. David knew who his Lord and Savior was. But God was also looking out for David. In this lowest moment, God is going to show David support that David didn't expect. He's going to have godly friends to encourage him. And he's going to face an uphill battle, literally. And yet, 
God is going to be with him and his friends are going to support him. So why don't we read this passage together? It's not very long. 2 Samuel 15, 18 through 37. And I'm going to do what we do every week. I'm going to ask you to stand in honor of God's word. So don't hit doors as you open them. But if I can have you stand and we're going to read God's word together. And I just remembered I wanted to take a picture tonight. So I got to get everybody and I can't fit everybody in. So hold on. Panorama. Here we go. If you're not out of your car, I'm not going to see you. No waving, no cheering, nothing? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Would have been really great if I was videoing. All right. So if you've got your Bibles... Read with me in 2 Samuel 15, starting in verse 18. And all his servants passed by him, and all the Cherethites and all the Pelethites, and all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath passed on before the king. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why do you also go with us? Go back and stay with the king. For you are a foreigner and also an exile from your home. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you wander about with us, since I go no, I know not where? Go back and take your brothers with you. May the Lord show steadfast love and faithfulness to you. But Ittai answered the king, As the Lord lives and as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. And David said to Ittai, Go then pass on. So Ittai the Gittite passed on with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. And all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by. And the king crossed the brook Kidron and all the people passed on towards the wilderness. We covered that last week, but these Gentiles and foreigners supported David and continued to fight with him. Verse 24, and Abiathar came up and behold, Zadok came also with all the Levites bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the Ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am, let him do to me what seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons, Ahamaz your son, and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. But David went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads, and they went up, weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. While David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai the archite, came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head. David said to him, If you go on with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so now I will be your servant, then you will defeat for me the counsel of Ahithophel. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? So whatever you hear from the king's house, Tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send to me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city just as Absalom was entering Jerusalem. You can be seated back in your cars. And we're going to get into these two chapters, looking at David's godly friends and then the uphill climb that he has before him. Let's look at verse 24 together and look at these friends that God sent to support David. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with him, with all the Levites, 
bearing the ark of the covenant of God and they set down the ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Here is the godly or priestly support that David did not expect. Remember, he is rejected as king. He did not expect the main priests, Zadok and Abiathar, to support him, to be willing to go with him in exile. Not only that, all the Levites, meaning all the priests of all of Israel, sided with David. David could have took the entire Old Testament church leadership with him. But you know what David did? Because David knew that God's name, God's church, and God's people was more important than him, David said, you can't go with me. He said, go back. I'm not going to divide God's people and God's church. Do you know how many leaders have left churches and split them? Getting people to side with them and leave the church with them? That's wrong. That's not what God has planned. If God has called a leader on from a church, they should leave respectfully and without a whole bunch of people following in their wake. Not dividing God's people. David is a godly leader, an example of this. But who are these guys that are mentioned? Abiathar is the guy I call the lone survivor. Have anybody seen movie with that name? But Abiathar is a guy who survived an all-out massacre. King Saul sent a guy named um, Doeg the Edomite to strike down and kill all the priests at the city of Nob. The only guy who survived. I mean, this guy Doeg slaughtered every priest that was in, the, in that city. Abiathar got away. He came to David, and David said these words to Abiathar in 1 Samuel 22, verse 20. But one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped, fled after David. And Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. And David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul. I have caused the death of all the persons of your father's house. Now listen to David's words to Abiathar. Stay with me. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. With me you shall be in safe keeping. And so Abiathar has bound his life to David's every day after this. He knew that the king would keep him safe. That those who were seeking his life were seeking the king's and David was going to protect him. And I feel like David's words to Abiathar could be Jesus' words to you and I. Listen carefully these words of our Lord to you in this moment. Stay with me, Jesus would say. Do not be afraid. For he who seeks my life seeks your life. Remember what Jesus said? The reason why the world hates you is it hated me first. If they hate me, they're going to hate you too. Jesus is saying, if they tried to kill me, they're going to try to kill everybody who loves me, everybody who follows me. That is the life of a Christian. And it's not that way in this world right now where we live. But it could be one day. And we need to be those who would follow Jesus in life and in death. And that's what we see of this priest named Abiathar. But you know what's fascinating about him? He belongs to a forsaken family line. Abiathar is descended from Eli the high priest who God had rejected because he allowed his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to do great evil in Israel. God said, you will no longer be a priest. You will no longer serve and neither will your sons be priests to me. And yet God still provided protection for a man who belonged to a forsaken family line. Because our God redeems forsaken families. Amen? God can take families that have lived their entire legacy of generations, hating Christ, turning from Him, and in one person and in one generation, God can turn the whole thing around and create a lineage of people who follow Jesus, not just your sons and daughters, but their children and their children's children after them. Because God redeems fallen families. Amen? And that's what we see in this person of Abiathar. He was going to follow King David. 
but also you have Zadok. Abiathar was the old priestly line. Zadok is the new priestly line. And these two godly men were willing to follow David. But not only that, they brought with them the most important artifact in all of Israel. The thing most central to worship in Israel. The Ark of the Covenant. That Ark is the one that David brought back from the land of the Philistines. And he established it in Jerusalem for God to be worshipped. And that ark symbolized God's very real presence and the promise of his favor through his covenant. And the priest said, David, we're going to follow you and we're going to bring the ark of God with us as we follow you. Man, if I was David, I'd be like, I need all the godly support. I need the ark of the covenant. Bring everything you got, guys. But David goes, no. You cannot bring the ark you cannot come with me. He was encouraged, I believe, but he knew that those men who were friends could serve him better back in Jerusalem. You see, whoever possessed the ark, people believed possessed the favor of God. But David knew better. David understood that the ark was only the representation of God's presence, but not the embodiment of it. This church is the same thing, folks. It is the embodiment of God's presence. It is symbolic of our worship of Him. But if the state or some leader came in and took away our church, confiscated it, turned it into a Walmart, whatever it is, because you don't have to social distance there, but whatever they did, if they took it, it doesn't mean God's favor is not on you and I. It doesn't mean that the favor of God has been taken from His church. Because nothing can stop the people of God from worshiping Him. Because our relationship with Him is not based on a building, but it's based on a body. The body of Christ that was crucified for you and I and rose again three days later. That is the foundation of our faith, our friendships, everything we stand for. Amen. And so we have here in the life of David a picture of a leader who was willing to lose everything and yet he lost nothing. Everything you value should be things that no person, no government, no entity could take from you. Your faith in Jesus is the one thing nobody can take from you. And it is the one thing that your entire life should be founded on. Your friendships, your life, your freedom, everything is based on your faith in Jesus. And that cannot be taken from you and I. So verse 25, the king says to Zadok, I got a plan for you guys. Carry the ark of God back into the city. And if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he himself will bring me back. And I will see both it and his dwelling place again. You see, this is why David sent the ark back. Because David knew that even though life circumstances looked really bad, he knew God was still for him and not against him. There's a song out right now called The Blessing. And if you've heard it on the radio, the words are very familiar because I end every single worship service with that benediction from Scripture. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. This song sings those lyrics, but there's a repetitive refrain at the end. And it is so powerful to hear this declaration. Jen and I were listening to it today, both of us getting choked up. I was in my office just writing down these lyrics and I started to get emotional. And these lyrics go like this. May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and you're going in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you. 
He is for you. He is for you. And it goes on and on that God is for you. There is not a more powerful and more simple truth that every person in the world today is longing for. It is that truth that God is for them. And yet we live in a world that says, I don't want to hear that. And yet it's what people need to hear more than anything else in the world today. He is for you. I hope you're willing to hear that today. I hope it is ringing in your heart and soul. And I hope it is filling you with the hope that God intended it to. David knew God was for him. Verse 26 but if God says, I have no pleasure in you, David says, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. You see, David knew God in a way that we all need to know him. David didn't argue with God. He didn't complain about God was do what God was doing. He accepted it as God's loving, sovereign will. And he said this, God is God. And he can do what he pleases. What, God, what pleases God is not always what pleases us, but it is what is best for us. Let me say that again. What pleases God is not what always pleases us, but it is always best for us. Verse 27. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons, Ahamaz your son and Jonathan the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem and they remained there. David created a counterinsurgency team. He wanted the godly friends to support him in ways that he needed most. They needed to go back to the city of Jerusalem under the authority of the fake king, Absalom, and bring news to David of what the king was doing. David was relying on them. He trusted them. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have friends in your life who are godly, who you can trust? Here's the thing. We all need it. And sometimes we look for friends in the wrong places, in the wrong circumstances and situations. Be friendly with everybody. Seek to live at peace with everybody. But invest your life with people who are a blessing and encouragement to you, and you can be that to them. Let it be friendships founded upon faith in Christ. The greatest friendships you and I have should be born in the context of the church body. This is where you should find friends who last forever. Now, we've all been hurt by people. We've all had friends who, when we were at our lowest, betrayed us or turned their backs on us. Don't let that prevent you from trusting another person. Because that person who may have turned against you, maybe been against you when you needed them most, guess what? It stirred you up. It helped you grow. God used it if you allow it to. And God might just bring a friend in a time of need like God did to David. David didn't need another person to kick him when he was down. And he has those people come in the next chapter. But right now, God's sending godly friends. And he sends another guy named Hushai. Look at this, verse 30. I'm going to read this section fast. David, then leaving Jerusalem, went up the Mount of Olives. You know the same one that Jesus went down into Jerusalem on Passion Week when he was crucified six days later? King David is going up the Mount of Olives. King Jesus, 14 generations later, was coming down it. One was rejected from being king, King David, and one was going into the city to be rejected as king. David sacrificed his position. Jesus sacrificed his life. You see the parallel. And so now, it says this, David went up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot with his head covered. And all the people were with, who were with him covered their heads, and they went up weeping as they went. David literally had an uphill climb. 
He was weeping, he was barefoot, and his head was covered in shame. But David had done nothing wrong. Who was the person who should have had shame? Not David. Absalom. He was the one who acted shamefully. And I want to speak to parents for a moment. Parents, have you ever taken and seen your child's behavior and felt that it was a reflection on how good or bad of a parent you were? Yes, we all have felt that way. And sometimes it's things they learned from us. Sometimes it's not. Parent, I want you to understand this truth. Your children are their own people. And when they grow up, they are their own person and they have their own choices. Your job is to raise them in Christ, to teach them and model to them what a life in Christ is. But the choices they make are their choices. They are not a reflection of you. We want our children to bring us pride and joy, even in their mistakes. We are proud of them. We can feel some shame and disappointment over mistakes and sins that they might commit. But do not think that it makes you a bad parent because you can teach kids what is right and they can choose wrong. I've seen parents teach kids what's wrong and the kids choose right. Have you ever seen that? You see this amazing person come out of a family dynamic that you're like, man, they did not have good parents modeling to them what life is like, and yet they are amazing people. And then you can have somebody who is loved in the Lord, raised in Him, and go the other way. Each person is responsible for their choices. You as a parent just need to do what God has called you to and trust God with your child. Amen? David was not responsible for what Absalom had done. But David felt great shame. It was told David that Ahithophel joined Absalom. And this is all David prays. Lord, turn Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. And God will do just that. Look at verse 32. While David was coming to the summit, the top of his uphill climb, where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head. Ladies and gentlemen, the last of David's friends, this guy named Hushai shows up and he's wearing the same clothing of grief that David was because he understood what it meant to empathize with a friend. You should have friends in your life that when you are joyful over an accomplishment in your life, they are not jealous, but they are genuinely excited for you. I've had friends who were jealous when something good happened in my life. Have you had that happen? That's not a healthy friendship. But I've had friends who, when something good happens in my life, they're excited. And when something good happens in their life, I'm excited. That's how friendship should function. And sometimes it takes some more maturity for us to get there, to not be jealous of other people. But Hushai also understood how powerful it is to grieve with your friend to bear their burdens with them, to walk that road of grief with them. And Hushai is ready to walk barefooted and clothes torn with his king and his friend David. But David sends him back as well. He says, if you go with me, you'll be a burden to me. David's saying, they're trying to kill me. If you come with me, they're going to try to kill you. I don't want your blood on my head. I want you safe. So I got a plan, Hushai. Go back and be my spy. Be my informant. And not only that, I want you to shut down the counsel of Ahithophel. And that's exactly how God turns Ahithophel's counsel into foolishness. Let me wrap it up with this, ladies and gentlemen. David, at the lowest point of his life, when his son was ready to kill him, betrayed him, and all of Israel, who used to see him as king, now rejected him. David understood one driving theme in his faith in the Lord is that God was in control and God was for him. Not only that, David understood a second thing, that in his time of need, God would send him godly friends to encourage him. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand this, that your faith in the Lord, your friendship with Christ, is the most important relationship you have in all the world. 
It is the most precious treasure you have and it is a thing that nobody can steal from you. But do not believe the lie today that if bad things are happening in your life, God is not for you. It's exactly the opposite. God is shaping you. God is fashioning you. God is going to use that difficulty to disciple you. But do not believe the satanic lie that God is not for you. He is for you. He is for you. And He is for you. For your children, their children, and their children after them. Amen? And if you don't have godly friends, ask God for them. Pray that God would bring people into your life that you can do life with, you can encourage, and they can encourage you. You don't want an Eeyore. You want a Tigger. Right? You want somebody who's ready to bounce around through life, good or bad with you, rather than Eeyore who sees everything as a bummer. You need people who are hopeful and encouraging in your life. And I firmly believe God is going to bring that to you if you ask Him for it. Amen? Let's pray. Let's wrap this up the right way. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight, Lord, for those who may be struggling or who may be doing great, I pray for the two pillars of support in David's life, that they would be a reality in all of ours. That, Lord, we would have faith in Jesus and we would have godly friends. Lord, may that be the reality. Lord, I pray that for our children. The children of this church, Lord, give them godly friends. Give them people who encourage them in Christ, who model to them what it means to be a teenager who loves Jesus, who can follow the Lord and still be fun and cool. Help them to have godly friends and help them to be godly friends. And Lord, I pray for every member of our church, everybody who's here, everybody who watches this sermon. Lord, may you grant to those who are longing for true godly friends to do the rest of their life with. Lord, I pray that you would bring those friends into their life. That, Lord, we would not be stagnant and not growing. But, Lord, stir us up in Christ. Place the right people in our life that we might grow as a church body and we might grow as individuals and glorify you and enjoy our lives in Christ. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here it comes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. God bless you all. Thank you for coming tonight.